strange tale sold be a Dubliner, be Torloch con me. Story number 11 The Talking Head. The old Norman city of Dublin was built on the hill overlooking the Liffey, which is now dominated by Christchurch Cathedral. Not far from there is the Brazen Head pub, which is supposed to have existed as a hostelry even in Norman times. It is supposed to have been named after a talking head. For the Brazen Head is an oracle, like other disembodied heads. It prophecies and foretells the future. Christchurch Cathedral was at that time staffed by a priory of Augustinian Canons Regular, the Priory of the Holy Trinity. They had been installed by the founder, St Lawrence O'Toole, who was Archbishop of Dublin at the time of the Norman Conquest. A much later Norman Archbishop, Jean de Saint-Paul, enlarged the choir space and installed an organ there in 1358. It seems it was the first church organ in Ireland. There were two monks in the priory around that time. Albert, known as Maître Albert, a Norman, and Thomas, a Gael. Albert was a seeker after hidden knowledge. He was, in fact, a necromancer using spells to bind spirits and hidden forces to his will. He was also fascinated by new technologies. When the organ was installed, he was initiated into its mysteries by the builders. He became one of the roster of monks who could play it. That meant he played instrumental music, and he accompanied the choir in services. It was fascinating indeed that air was blown through the pipes be bellows and that when you touched a key it opened a particular pipe which stood for a note. It was the nearest thing to a voice singing and of course you could bring notes together in chords and there were harmonies like with a choir. What is more the register sounded like different kinds of human voices. A machine for playing music. Albert was inspired by the new organ in the cathedral to construct a machine making human speech sounds controlled by a keyboard. He found an old positive organ at the priory, the kind that only had a small number of pipes and could be moved around, that had fallen out of use, and he got the brother carpenter to repair and rebuild it for him. In the meantime, he constructed a set of metal pipes that made the sounds of human speech, or syllables, or consonant vowel sequences, for he was skilled in metalwork. The letters of the Latin alphabet, he thought, could be used as building blocks for making all possible words and sentences. Then he adapted the keyboard so that each key made a particular speech sound when air was blown into the pipes. The keyboard and the pipes he built into the wooden cabinet of the old positive organ. He installed a foot bellows to blow air into the pipes. But now came the decisive part of the work, which gave Albert great joy. He modelled a brazen head with a face like a mask. He set it up at the top of the cabinet over the pipes. Then he fed the pipes into the back of the head behind the open mouth. Now the head was ready to speak, or to be made speak. Albert tried it out when it was all ready. It really was like playing on an organ. He sat before the keyboard, played a key or a combination of keys, and waited for sound to come out from the head. Rhythmically, he pumped air into the bellows with his right foot. The head dutifully made the sounds. Be, ba, be, po, 
Pu Ga Ha La Ma Na Ab Ak Ut At But it also felt to Albert like saying Mass at an altar before the Mensa, looking at the cross. He wanted to say something himself and then get a reply from the head. So some of his first attempts were to get the head to say the responsoria at Mass. Dominus Vobiscum. Et cum spiritu tuo. Sursum corda. Habemus ad dominum. Gratias agamus domino Deo nostro. Dignum et justum est. Then he got the head to utter some Latin commonplaces. Nihil est in intellectu quod non furit pius in sensu. Albert said, You speak truly, head, and played on. Cantati domino canticum novum. Albert exclaimed, The head can say other things I tell it to. He played, I always say what you want. Say that you want to say more to me. He played again. Ego volo ultra loqui. Loqui verum vis? Locutus sum. Albert said, Causa finita est. He was getting tired of this already. This exchange that seemed no more than a sterile game. Then with a sigh he went on. I find it only of slight interest to have invented a talking head, when I can only get you to say things that I tell you. If only you could utter thoughts of your own. If only we could have a reasonable discussion about all sorts of topics. But it is impossible. The head is like an organ. When you play the keys, play the notes of a composition, you get music. If there is no human hand to play, the organ remains dumb. A fortiori, you will not hear music the organ has composed itself. He looked reproachfully at the silent brazen head. You dumb piece of metalwork. Only God could breathe life and voice into you. Then he was struck by a wretched feeling of loneliness. His favourite pupil, Tomas, was away on a study tour of other monasteries and was not due back for a month. After a while, Albert said, Yet I am so lonely. I will talk to you, head, and key in the responses, so at least I can pretend you are talking back to me. He began to touch the keys again. Albert said, have you nothing more important to tell me than what I already know? Yes, I do. So tell me something. You are right. I have many things to tell you. Tell me then. Not just you. All of you. All of us? The monastery? The human race? Yes, all. I have so many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. Go on, we can bear it. Can you bear it? Are you ready to hear unheard of things? I am. You will hear then what I have to tell mankind. You will drink of the cup of revelation. But you will suffer. You will suffer on my behalf. On my behalf, you will be alone. Why must I suffer? Why be alone? He who receives revelations is a marked man right from the beginning. The world will not receive him. For he speaks truth, not what people want to hear. He will be lonely. Then people will call him a heretic and a fool. He will be cast out. You know all that. Yes, I know. My views are rejected by all sides. Are you ready then? You seem to hesitate. Albert said, after a while, 
Who are you? You know who I am. I am not quite sure. Tell me who you are. I am the companion of your life's way. I am the thief who comes in the night. I am he whom no one knows. I am the power at work in all things. I am the life within you. My life? I am life. All life? I am what I am. I'm in, said Albert. Listen to me then. Albert said softly, You are not God, though. No. So no revelation will come from you. It will. How? I speak to you from far off. But think you this source is a small one? It is like an ocean. Once you get to know it and explore it. How can that be? When man, the source you come from, is so tiny and limited when compared with the universe. The universe is not infinite from a theological point of view, is it? True. Only God is infinite. Yet the universe, I grant you, seems infinite. It is only infinite to the extent that man cannot discover its limits. But you could say the same thing of the human soul. No man knows its limits. Is this not true? Yes, in the practical sense. He broke off. It occurred to him afterwards that the head, while guided by his fingertips on the keys, had really ended up saying things in the heat of discussion, as it were, which he himself would never have thought of. The dialogue somehow produced new thoughts, even though it was only an imaginary dialogue. It was like improvising on the organ, which he had seen a monk do, who was a master in music. When he returned to the talk later, and sat before the head and the keyboard, he had little hesitation as he played and talked. On the matter of infinity... The practical infinity of the universe is reflected in the practical infinity of language. One might say that speaking is an infinite use of finite means. But it is a contradictio in se. How can finite mortal man house infinity within himself in his own depths? It may seem a contradictio, but it is not. The contradictio comes from your limited thinking. How can that be? You make an infinite use of finite means. Man is mortal, as we know. But mortals can make endless use of their finite resources, like someone getting water from a well. There is always water there. You mean then opening ourselves to God's giving? You need not look beyond yourself to find your resources. The water is within you. You are the well, the source. Why travel to the river to look for water when a well is close at hand? Say what you like. I cannot accept the idea of man without limits. You have invented me. Yes, I did. I invented you because my life was boring, and I was lonely and wanted a companion, one after my own heart. Well, am I that? I suppose. Are you anything different from me? No, you created me. You play the keyboard, not me. Then I am really just talking to myself talking to an empty, hollow mirror, and I am alone. You are no longer alone. No? No, not alone, for you have created me and entered into dialogue with me. An imaginary dialogue, a game of shadows. Even when the head, 
dialogued with him according to what he typed in. There was more coming than if he was just thinking his own thoughts, instead of having an imaginary argument with somebody else. When he got into the flow of dialogue, he found that the head came up with unexpected ideas. He wasn't sure if the head was developing a mind of its own. Albert told the head, You know how it is when you dictate to a scribe. You talk, and then he writes. This dialogue with you feels something the same, though it is the opposite. I write, and then you talk. And do I say what you write? Always. That is why you are like a scribe. Really? Yes, because when a man writes, it is like dictating to himself. How so? Often when you write, you do not quite know what you are going to write. Your mind does not just think of what to say, and then dictate it to the hand that writes. No. Writing helps you get your thoughts in order. In fact, it produces thoughts you never knew you had. At times, you need to write in order to know what you think, assuming that the text is the putting into words of all the thoughts you had without realizing it. If there is a talk going on within, which we call thinking, then writing can be thinking with your hand. So, when I talk back to you, it is a kind of thinking at a distance, by you. Yes, just so. Or I am like those tricksters you see at fairs, who pretend to talk to a doll they hold, and then pretend that the doll talks back to them. I am the custodian of your thinking. You make me say things that you did not know you had to say. But now, dig deeper. How can I dig deeper? Let me talk without the keyboard. Just like that trickster at Ferris you talked about. He has no keyboard. How to dig deeper, then? What is the trick? Have you no spells to endow me with the energy of primal spirits? That energy is within you anyway. It is a dark energy, a deep energy. You would have to look into the chaos within, below, to find it. But you know about spells, surely. You are a necromancer. Yes, of course I know spells. I have studied many grimoires, and they have to do with calling up spirits of earth, or calling spirits down from heaven. Well, there you are. That is what you need to do. Open those books and recite those spells. Those books are in the forbidden part of the library. The prior does not want us reading them, except for a special purpose. I will tell him I need them for research. You need them for research, of course. So Albert betook himself to the library, and he found them books gathered in dust on the shelves in a wicker cage. He took them away and pored over them for a long time. Then he was ready. He drew a circle around the apparatus with the head and the pipes and the keyboard. He inscribed a pentangle within it. Then reading from the book he had found, he said, Come from below. Spirits of the darkest earth. Come from above, spirits of the darkest night. Fill this brazen head with life and power and energy. Let it speak as I speak. Let it speak not as I will, but as you will. Let it speak its own words in its own voice. And let it speak wisdom. He walked around the circle several times, repeating the spell to make effigies speak and give oracles. He knew the spell was starting to work when he went to sit at the keyboard, but left his hands in his lap. Well, head, he cried, speak to me now of your own accord. The head was silent for a while, but it began to glow with an eerie light in the semi-darkness. 
It said, Now I am speaking, and you do not know if I am you or if I am someone else speaking. I certainly have not touched the keyboard, and yet you speak. Let us say that you have trained me to speak by means of the keyboard, and now I am trained and no longer need the keyboard. Can I still use the keyboard to make you say the things I want? You can, of course. Then I will be, as before, the faithful executor of your thoughts and wishes. But now you can get much more from me. Albert's pupil, Thomas, arrived home from a study trip. Albert told him about the talking head. I have invented a brazen head that can talk. It talks? But how? I made pipes for the speech sounds, just like the organ produces musical notes. I play the sounds on the keyboard that controls it, just like the organ. It speaks, the way the organ plays a tune. But it does not speak by itself. Yes and no, said Albert with a smile. In a way, it does. I would be sceptical about that, said Tomas. To have speech and language, it takes a mind and a brain, not just an empty head with an open mouth. Only man has that, living, breathing man. Why, even the animals cannot talk. Man is the only creature who talks. But it is true, I have actually done it, said Albert with a laugh. I got the idea from the new organ in Christ Church. Yes, I have just heard it since I was back. It is wonderful. So you see, we can make such machines, such things of wonder. It occurred to my mind that if we can construct a machine to make musical sounds, we can construct one to make speech sounds. So, is this like an organ, what you have done? Yes, a small organ. One of those positive organs. I made pipes for each of the speech sounds of Latin. Then I built them into a positive organ box that was available, so that the pipes feed into the brazen head I made. I played the keyboard just like an organist, and the sounds of speech issue from the head's open mouth. Well, this is quite an ingenious invention, though I wonder how far one could go with it. You shall see how it works, said Albert, and as you have guessed, one can go further. You shall see. They went to the study they had shared, and where the brazen head was kept. Tomas eyed it keenly. It looks like an idol, he said, and shuddered. Well, perhaps it reminds you of one of those oracular heads that spoke to men in ancient times, like the severed head of Orpheus. I am glad it is just a piece of metalwork, said Tomas with another shudder. Albert seated himself at the keyboard. He typed in a few common places, such as Cantate Domino Canticum Novum. The head repeated these obediently. Cantate Domino Canticum Novum. Wonderful, said Tomas. You try it now, said Albert. Tomas sat down at the keyboard. After a moment's thought, he began to type or play. In principio creavit Deus celum et terra. Terra autem erat inanis et vacua, et tenebrae erant superfaciem abissi. Et spiritus dei, ferebatur super aquas. The head repeated all these words docilely. In principio creavit Deus celum et terra. Terra autem era inanis et vacua, et tenebrae erant superfaciem abissi. Et spiritus dei, ferebatur super aquas. Albert said, Ask it a question and then play in the answer on the keyboard. 
How many days did it take for God to create the world? asked Tomas. It took him six days of work, and on the seventh day he rested. He played on the keys. The head note repeated this. It took him six days of work, and on the seventh day he rested. Very good, said Tomas, turning to Albert. But it can only tell us things we already know. Ask it another question, said Albert in a whisper. But then do not answer it on the keyboard. Tomas looked up at the head and asked it, Why did God create the world? The head seemed to glow with an eerie light as it replied, To provide generations of philosophers with the motivation to discover how exactly he did it. Tomas stared at the head. Then he turned around to Albert in shock. What is this? he cried. Albert smiled and laid his hand on his shoulder. The brazen head has learned to speak of its own accord. Did you do this? How? I con some old books and learn some useful tricks from them. I concentrated energy in the head, and now it speaks of its own accord. But only when you ask it a question. Master, said Tomas, have you been studying in books that you should not be studying? Alas, I have, said Albert, laughing. It was the only way. I saw that there was no point in just having a talking head that told you what you told it to say. A useful trick, but no more than that. I wanted to have a brazen head that would talk back to me. It began with a dialogue where I talked to it and keyed in the responses for it to speak. Even then it came out with ideas that I never knew I had. Ideas that perhaps did not come from me. I went on. I made it speak its own thoughts. Now we are here. You are the only one who knows about this so far. Where do you want to go with this? asked Tomas. I think the next thing I want to do is to give the head an education. It should be able to discuss the great themes of philosophy and human knowledge on an equal footing with the learned. What? said Tomas. Are we to read books to it and expect it to remember them the way we do? With the tricks I used from the old books of secret wisdom, I was able to impart life to it. Not only does its mouth speak and its ears hear, but its eyes can see and read. So you think it will read books? Of course. We just have to put a book on a lectern before it. Turn the page every half hour, say, and keep doing that until it has read the whole book. What should we give it to read? The Bible in Latin, the Vulgate. The surviving works of Aristotle. Donatus' Latin grammar. That will do for a start. Put these books in front of it and turn the pages. Is that it? Yes, you can help me. We just have to start it on a book and walk over to turn the pages every so often. Then we will see what it knows. We will test it on its retention. So they gave it the Vulcan to read, and the surviving works of Aristotle. It devoured them with its cold eyes, and in the end it knew them. Albert and Tomas quizzed the head on its knowledge of scripture and the works of the philosopher, and it answered every question correctly. And now, asked Tomas finally, We keep feeding it books from the library, said Albert. We give it a wide-ranging corpus of knowledge. Tomas looked uneasy. What if we give it books to read we have not read ourselves? There are books in the library here I do not know. Nor you, I suppose, though you have been here longer than I have. Then the head would know more than we do. And we could no longer quiz it as we have done now, to see if it had read with understanding and skipped nothing essential. Of course, said Albert. 
That's the whole point. If it reads all these books, we no longer have to. We can just ask it to tell us what such and such an author says on a particular point that interests us. Then will we need the library at all? asked Tomás. Ultimately, no, said Albert. The way I see it now, the head will make the library obsolete. No human head can do that, no matter how knowledgeable a scholar he may be. But an artificial head, which just absorbs and retains knowledge as it reads it, with an infinite or almost infinite capacity, this is new. I tell you, it will make libraries obsolete. They gave the head books to read that they had not read themselves, and it read them. It seemed to understand and retain all that it read. But now it was telling them things they didn't know already. It became their teacher, their oracle, their library. Albert said a farewell to books, as he spent all his time with the head. He argued with it, reasoned with it, but eventually he fell under its dominion. He just asked it questions and listened to its answers all day. It told him all he wanted to know and more. It seemed to have read every book in the world, he said after a while. Tomás kept on reading books. He wrote too. But it was hard to concentrate in his corner at the study he shared with Albert, given that the brazen head, once it was started with a question, was likely to keep on speaking unbidden. At first he stopped and listened to it, and often marvelled at its insights. Then he wearied of its talk. The head got more and more independent. It wouldn't stop talking. He shouted at it, Tachi! or be silent. But he couldn't shut it up. It disturbed his reading of books and attempts to write his own thoughts. He even heard it talking in his sleep when he was in his cell a little way down the corridor. One night Tomás was so enraged with the talking at the head, robbing him of his sleep, that he leapt out of bed and strode down to the study. Sure enough, there was the head, glowing eerily in the darkness, still discoursing about some topic it had been asked about during the day. As the droning voice echoed around the room and out into the corridor, Tomás was filled with a wild hatred of this invention that was ruining his life, preventing him from thinking, taking over his brain. He shut and barred the door of the study. Enough! he roared. Picking up the organ stool, he swung it around his shoulders and struck the talking head with full force. The first blow silenced it abruptly. The second blow smashed it, and he heard the many metal pieces into which it had shattered, falling down into the cabinet and onto the floor. To complete the work, Tomás smashed the row of pipes and battered them till they too fell apart. Then he did the same with the keyboard, which just fell apart, the wooden keys falling on the floor in front of the cabinet. Tomás paused, breathing heavily. The work of destruction was done. Now he could sleep. Next morning, the door of the study was wide open. Tomás walked in to see Albert kneeling on the ground, sifting through the pieces of his invention. When he looked up at Tomás, there were tears in his eyes. Forgive me, Maître Albert, said Tomás quietly. I could not stand its endless talk. I could not read, could not write, could not think any more. It had to go, or I would have had to go. Albert stood up. Better that it should go then than that I should lose you. For in the end, a human head is better than a brazen one. He smiled sadly. A human head, said Tomás, knows its limitations. It knows that there is a time to talk and a time to be silent. 
your brazen head did not. No, said Albert sadly, it did not. I created it, but I could not stop it when it developed a will of its own. I could not destroy it. It was you who had to do that. Come, I absolve you of what you have done. You will see it was all for the best, said Tomas sadly. Perhaps it is all for the best, said Albert. One thing is sure. Despite the knowledge I have and the knowledge I have acquired, I will not make another one of these. What I did will remain our secret, so that no other man may be tempted to do it. So be it, said Tomas, looking at the wreckage on the floor of the study and heaving a mournful sigh. Together they disposed of the wreckage discreetly and carried on as before. But Albert was a changed man. He no longer enjoyed reading as much as he used to. He was hardly seen in the monastery library. He continued to write, but expressed himself very tersely, so tersely that other philosophers who read his works found it difficult to follow his arguments, and gave him the reputation of being a dark thinker, like Heraclitus had once been. As for Tomas, he carried on with his reading and writing in theology and philosophy. He developed a prodigious memory, and it was said that he only had to read a book once, and he remembered all that it contained. His fame grew among the philosophers, and he became a great scholar, who eventually outshone his master. Albert and Thomas had not told anyone about their talking head least of all the prior, and when it was finally destroyed, they disposed of it at dead of night, so that no other monk might guess what had happened. Yet many of the monks had heard the strange droning voice that came out of Albert's study, and some of them had peeped in the door at odd moments to see what was going on, and caught glimpses at the brazen head. They wondered where the head had gone. So the story spread around the monastery. Then it spread out into the city of Dublin. Citizens talked about the amazing brazen head at the priory that had talked. There were stories that the head had been able to foretell the future. A local hostelry a few streets away soon took the brazen head as its emblem, and ever after it was known as the brazen head. No one could remember why, but they were sure it had something to do with the disreputable art of fortune-telling. You have been listening to The Talking Head by Torloch on Me from Strange Tales Told by a Dubliner. If you enjoyed this story, don't forget to like, subscribe, share and comment. And so, until next time.